welcome everyone. It's like, just like we didn't adjourn. <laughs> All both. Um, this is now our new committee room. We have a little more room for guests. A lot more air, which is the goal. Why don't we go around and do the introductions of the committee members, and, and actually maybe the room too, so people can um, know who's here. Uh, Ellen, would you start? Sure. Yeah. Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. I will be the Legislative Council on Act 250, uh, Natural Resources more broadly. Jim McCullough, I serve uh, as representative of the brave little hamlet of Willis. <laughs> and I'm Carrie Dolan. I represent Washington 7 District, which includes Wheatsfield, Warren, Paceton, Moortown, and Duxbury. Leland Morgan, representing Grand Isle County and West Milton. Harvey Smith from Madison County. I represent the towns of Mahaven, Weybridge, and Bridport. Paul LaFay from Newark, and I represent eight towns in the Northeast Cape. Usually you tell us. <laughs> It'll take a long time. I can remember them. <laughs> uh, I represent Middlebury. Uh, Trevor Squirrel representing Underhill and Jericho. <laughs> Chris Bates, Bennington 2 1. Matt Hill, I have uh, Johnson Hyde Park, Wolcott, and Belvedere. Carol Odie, I'm at the confluence of the Minuski and the, and the Lake, and Lake Champlain in Burlington, the New North End. Tom Terran, Zuni, Rutland Town. Hi, I'm Mark Grimes. I'm the new committee assistant here at and if it's okay, I'd love to go around the room. So just say you know who you are and if you're representing someone. I'm Hannah Johnson. I'm interning for MMR. Marcy Gallagher. I'm with Deepberg. I'm Karen Blakelock. I'm within the Crossing Group. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Cockham with the Department of Housing and Community Development. Peter Walk, Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources. Millie Archer, Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Kate McCarthy, Sustainable Communities Program Director at the Vermont Natural Resources Council, the NRC. Uh, Diane Snelling, Chair of the Natural Resources Board. My name is Helen Van Beck. I'm interning with Vermont uh, Transportation Agency. John Brabant, representing Vermonters for a Clean Environment. Ed Stanick, retired state employee. John Dillon, Vermont Public Radio. Jane Clifford, Morris Relation Government Relations Group. Greg Bobo with the Natural Resources Board. Evan Meenan, also with the Natural Resources Board. Michael Snyder, Commissioner Forest Parks and Recreation. Andrew Brewer with Downs Ragland Martin. Laura Notes, newly with the Nature Conservancy. Nancy Lynch, the Vermont Association of Realtors. Oh, sorry, who's with the camera and where are you? Hi, Orca Media, Global uh, Community Access. Great, what's clear. your name? Uh, Adam Blair. Adam, I'm Jim Dandino, I'm with Trevor Piper, Eggleston, and Cranber here on behalf of the City of Burlington. Uh, Brian Shoup, the Executive Director of the NRC. I'm Billy Coster with the Agency of Natural Resources. Great, thank you all. Um, so with that, we are going to do a review of our committee bill from last session with Ellen, and then we're going to hear about some um, new um, work that or work that's been done over the summer. Um, after that, from the administration and Vermont Natural Resources Council. Without further ado, Ellen, take it away. Great. Uh, just as a reminder, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. I am here on 19-0040, which is your committee bill uh, an act related to changes to Act 250. So when last we spoke, I was here in April, um, and this is the committee bill that you have spent quite a bit of time on, uh, but to review where we came from, in 2017, Act 47 was enacted to create the Commission on Act 250 the next 50 years. There is a uh, big, beautiful compilation of the report over there that I'm going to reference briefly, but six legislators spent a year and a half looking at the history of Act 250, the original purpose with which it was enacted, and uh, the legislation asked the commission to look at how successful the original, the act had been at meeting the original goals of the finding. Findings. So uh, the commission had 14 advisors and they spent a year and a half engaging with the public, learning the history of Act 250, and looking at the changes that have happened in Vermont in the last 50 years. Act 250 was enacted in 1970, so now that it is 2020, we are approaching the 50 year anniversary, and the commission looked at what could be ahead for the next 50 years 
of Act 250 and what changes might need, might need to be made to reflect the changes that have happened in Vermont. So the report came out uh, about a year ago. The commission made 33 recommendations and also produced a draft piece of legislation to incorporate those changes. And your committee spent time looking at that draft bill and all of the recommendations and deciding which ones to focus on. Uh, so I'm going to uh, bring your attention to the chart in a minute. Um, but you worked through multiple drafts. You heard from a number of the technical advisors um, from the commission, as well as a lot of members of the the various agencies who were involved in Act 250, and uh, you took a significant amount of testimony from the public and uh, the, the private sector on Act 250 and the proposed changes from the commission. So when we left off in April, we were on draft 9.2. Uh, that document is on your website. I am not going to do a walkthrough of it. I'm going to walk you through this chart that's on the screen. And this chart, you have seen a version of it, I think last February I had a draft of it for you. And it does a, a high level overview of what the changes are um, that in incorporate the recommendations into this bill. So, the first uh, major set of changes uh, have to do with the capability and development plan. That plan was part of the original Act 250 and it was called for in section 6042. So the first uh, major change is in the bill adds a new finding. Uh, the capability and development plan is a set of 19 findings that list the details that are to guide the, um, the implementation of Act 250. So this one adds, a, so the first change adds a new finding for to address greenhouse uh, gas emissions and climate change. The next change uh, amends finding number two, which adds ecosystem protection to the already existing section related to utilization of natural resources. The next change in the bill uh, um, adds a section 6000 which adds a purpose section to Act 250. Uh, it explicitly re references the capability and development plan, as well as the goals of the municipal and regional planning, which is chapter 117 of Title 24. Um, so I think, uh, stepping back, we're gonna look at this chart broadly, and I'm not gonna do a specific walkthrough, but if you have questions, we can talk about them now, or I will definitely be here more in the future for the specific language questions. So the next change uh, updates the maps. So it requires the county level capability and development maps um, to be updated to reference for, for reference in Act 250 review. They have not been updated in a while. So you will also recall that there are, so those are a couple of the minor changes, but there are some large uh, categories of changes. Um, so the first one being amending the existing Act 250 criteria to address climate change. So this is accomplished in a few different ways. So first, uh, there's an amendment to, act to criterion one to separate out air from water pollution. Currently, criterion one addresses both air and water pollution. So first, we make criterion one just related to air pollution. In addition, your bill adds subcriterion 1A to address air contaminants. And it also adds subcriterion 1B to address <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Next, uh, the newly created criterion two uh, is for water pollution. And so it updates the definitions uh, to, in to reflect uh, the Agency of Natural Resources extensive work related <coughs> to flood hazard areas and river corridors. So the, the definition section is updated to match 
and reference the water uh, regulations and uh, criterion two is amended to reflect that as well. Next, the existing criteria two and three are combined and those are both related to uh, existing water supply. Next, criterion five is amended in two ways. That's the traffic criterion. So first it is amended to require review of projects for safety and congestion impacts to both bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. And also it clarifies when it is appropriate to require um, transportation demand management strategies. Also um, amended is criterion 9F and that is amending the energy criterion to include explicit reference to energy efficiency and stretch codes. It currently only references energy conservation. So the next major set of changes relates to forest fragmentation and habitat protection. Uh, this, you will remember that this work originally related to a bill known as H233, which um, was uh, came out of a few sessions ago, um, but you did amend it a bit. So you amend criterion eight to include a new subcriterion eight B, forest blocks, and eight C, connecting habitat, and it adopts an, a, an avoid and minimize strategy for fragmentation. You did remove the requirement for mitigation um, in April when we last spoke. Uh, another change is the burden shift. Uh, the burden is shifted so that the burden of persuasion under Criterion 8A is on the applicant now. Uh, currently, under statute, it's on the person opposing the application. To remind us of what 8A is and what that really means, the burden of persuasion. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, we rewrote the whole burden uh, section 8A has to do with wildlife, um, and so currently under statute, a person who is opposing an application has the burden to prove that there are adverse impacts to wildlife habitat. Um, <coughs> the committee heard testimony that this is a difficult thing for an opponent to prove because the landowner is in control of the, the data related to the actual project site. So having the burden be on an, op an opponent to an application is difficult. So this requires that the applicant has to um, provide enough information to persuade the district commission that they have not caused adverse impacts to wildlife habitat. Um, and another change requires the Agency of Natural Resources to include forest blocks on their resource maps. So the next set of changes relates to interstate interchange protection. Uh, it does a series of things related to interstate interchanges. It adds a new subcriterion 9I to protect the area uh, in interstate interchanges that are outside of existing settlements. It also adds a jurisdictional trigger for development um, that is proposed to take place within an interstate interchange that is not within an existing settlement. And you add a definition of interstate interchange area. Um, also, it adds a change so that permits can be denied under the traffic criterion 5 if it is located within an interchange area. Next change is to criterion 9K, which is the public investment criterion. And it updates this criterion to include forms of public investment that have been developed since 1970. Next, we get into some changes related to planning. Uh, first, regional plans. It requires, your, your bill requires regional plans to be approved as consistent with the statutory planning goals. It also clarifies criterion 10 uh, so that 
regional plan provisions apply to a project if they meet the same mm -hmm. standard of specificity that is applicable to statutes. Uh, and this came out of recent case law, which requires that um, a regional plan be clear enough to be understood by a, a person of ordinary <laughs> un intelligence. intelligence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not sure what that is, but it's, it's, it's not, not, <laughs> not, not, not uh, Next, it also requires the regional plans to include the location of critical resources, which we will talk about shortly. Next, municipal plans. Uh, the, your bill requires municipal plans to be consistent with the statutory goals for municipal and regional planning. It also amends Criterion 10 so that it can be used, to, to be used in Act 250, a municipal plan must obtain approval from the Regional Planning Commission. Next, you added the road rule as a jurisdictional trigger. That is a, a previous, that is a former piece of Act 250 that had been repealed and, in, and it has now been added back into your bill. And then next is uh, one of the other major groups of changes that uh, both the commission looked at as well as your committee. It's the idea of multi-tier jurisdiction combined with enhanced the designation. So, as part of a balancing of interest to support economic development in compact centers while promoting rural countryside and protecting important natural resources, your bill amends jurisdiction to allow municipalities that ensure compliance with criteria, uh, the criteria in centers to receive an enhanced designation under 24 BSA Chapter 76A while increasing Act 250 jurisdiction in critical resource areas and at interstate interchanges. So those two things are together. Uh, it also creates an appeal process for the designation decisions. So your bill adds a definition for critical resource areas and um, any development within a critical resource area uh, are subject to Act 250 jurisdiction. So you're increasing jurisdiction in areas that you have um, determined to be critical while exempting uh, development that is located within an area that's been given enhanced designation. So you added a definition of critical resource area and you also added a definition for rural and working lands and uh, development or subdivisions within the rural and working lands area uh, trigger uh, Act 250 jurisdiction depending on the number of acre or lots. So then, uh, related to enhanced designation, you establish an enhanced designation program. So a municipality with a designated downtown, village center, new town center, or growth center are eligible to apply for this enhanced designation. And the municipality that has one of those um, areas must demonstrate that its bylaws comply with Act 250 criteria that has the capability to review development for compliance with those criteria. And they must identify the critical resource areas in that municipality. And if, they, if a municipality can demonstrate those things, the state board can grant uh, a, an enhanced designation, which would allow for development in that area to be exempt from Act 250. Enhanced designation uh, decisions are appealable to VERB, which I will talk about in a moment, which is the new board your bill creates. And it exempts the projects within the, the enhanced designation area. And there, it also repeals, uh, your bill also repeals the exemption for farming, logging, and forestry if they are located within an area that's a critical resource area. So that is a, a brief summary of the changes related to multi-tier jurisdiction. Next, uh, you, amend, you add a definition clarifying uh, commercial purpose. 
so that it is not necessary to determine whether monies are received, mo whether monies received are essential to sustain a project. Also, your bill requires the development cabinet to meet regularly. And I will point out that in last session, Another committee repealed the development cabinet entirely, so if you want to move forward with that change, we'll need to either reenact that statute or um, do something else. Next, you also increase the per diem rate for the district commissioners to $100 from the current $50. And then we have the new board. So your bill proposes to replace the current Natural Resources Board with the Vermont Environmental Review Board, or VERB, which would hear appeals from the District Commission decisions and the Agency of Natural Resources in addition to their current duties. This board would be a five-member board appointed by the Judicial Nominating Board They would, the, with members having four-year terms, and the chair is full-time. The environmental division of the Superior Court would continue to hear enforcement issues as well as uh, local zoning permit appeals. It also assigns the risk of non-persuasion to an appellant in an appeal. And then... Uh, Could we have clarification? Risk of non-persuasion? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at risk for that all the time, I think, but no. I... <laughs> uh, I think that's just, I, I can't speak to it at the moment. Okay. I need to refresh my memory. All right, that works. Because that, I, yeah. That's cool. So another, cha another change made is related to the supervisory authority of permits. So it reaffirms the supervisory authority um, of the, the board and the district commissions um, in matters under Act 250 which was the original intent of Act 250. Next, there's a set of changes related to permit presumptions. So your bill revises and clarifies the statutory authority on the use of other permits to demonstrate compliance with the criteria, and including ensuring the reliability of those permits. So to get a presumption, the board must determine that the permit was issued as part of a program that reliably meets its goals. Um, it lowers the standard for rebutting a presumption, and no presumption is allowed for permits that allow for the discharge of pollutants into impaired waters. Next, <coughs> slate quarry, uh, we have a series of changes related to slate quarries. So slate quarries under your bill under your bill, slate quarries cannot be held in reserve if they are not in use. Uh, registered slate quarries must provide notice to their uh, adjacent property owners. And the Agency of Natural Resources will add the registered slate quarries to the Natural Resources Atlas. In addition, uh, your bill requires that owners of pre-existing pits and quarries uh, of other rocks and minerals submit extraction data to the board in order to establish a baseline against which substantial changes may be determined. Your bill also creates a process <laughs> under which property can be released from Act 250 jurisdiction. And finally, uh, some of the most recent changes that you made in April relate to a racial equity review. So the the session law provision in your bill uh, asks the executive director of racial equity, the racial equity advisory panel, and the human rights commission to conduct a review of the processes, procedures, and language of Act 250 to assess, to assess the extent to which Act 250 has contributed to act adverse impacts on racial equity and diversity within the state. All right, do uh, members have questions or what clarification on everyone understands it all? I have yeah. one. Already. I have one. Yeah. Um, we have to go back to the municipal plan. Sure. Where it says required municipal 
plans to be consistent with statutory proposals for municipal and regional planning. What exactly is that again? So under 24 BSA 4302, there are a list of uh, goals and requirements for municipal plans. And currently, uh, municipal plans may be consistent with them. So your bill changes the may to a shall so that they have to be consistent with those goals. Uh, okay. And they have to be consistent with those goals in order to be approved and accepted um, and then therefore part of Act 250 review. Yes, it requ uh, the regional planning commissions then um, approve the municipal plans as consistent and then they can be used under criterion 10 as uh, to evaluate whether the project complies with that also. So one more thing. So how does that work for like Bennington? If we don't really follow, we're parallel to Act 250, but we don't actually follow it. So how would that work for Bennington or it doesn't? It would work for something like Arlington where they would follow it. So, um, and I am not an expert, but I ha I do know that Bennington has a pretty detailed town right. plan. Um, and so I don't know specifically to the, the extent to which it has been approved as consistent, but because there is significant detail in that plan already. So right. when a project would come up, um, the project would be uh, evaluated against Criterion 10 to see if it is consistent with the plan that Bennington has in place. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And is there, Chris, would you be able to speak to whether, yeah. do you know anything about the Bennington plan? Bennington's plan is uh, um, is approved, um, okay. so it would play into Act 250. Yeah, I was just kind of wondering how, because uh, when I talk to Dan Monks, mm -hmm. he says one thing, then I come here and I hear another thing, and it's kind of confusing, so. So both the region and, and the local municipality have, have plans that play into right. Act 250 through Criterion 2. Perfect. Thank you. There are town plans that have been adopted that have not been approved as consistent. And so I think that is sort of the space that this change is looking to address. Yeah. Towns have adopted plans, but they aren't consistent, and so they haven't been approved. Do we have a sense of how many plans that might be? I, I realize that's a total. <coughs> Maybe someone else in the room knows how many plans. About not that we won't. I'd have to hunt. It varies. In the majority, I want to say eighty percent of towns have. This is all part have plans that meet the requirements. Yeah, eighty percent. Yeah, and there. Are, oh, how many towns don't have plans? Um, a, a smaller subset. Certain community, you know, a very small um, subset of towns just don't have plans, and then there's a smaller subset that has. You know, they may have a plan, but they don't have zoning. Um, right. And I can get you the data on that. Yeah. If you want. Oh, yeah, that would be good. Okay. Any other questions for Ellen? I have a question. Sure. On the slate quarries, uh, we have, did a letter go out to the uh, uh, stakeholders and they were going to meet over the summer and then come back with a report? Am I, is that correct? Yes. And this committee did send a report, yeah. or uh, a letter to the, state, to the stakeholders. Yes, and, and did that result in a report from the stakeholders? Or no? I haven't heard anything. I don't know. So what's being proposed here? This was this precedes what we were talking about in terms of sending the letter. Out, right? Yes, this is uh, the last time you made changes to nine point two was um, in April. I think it was April twelfth. So, so that predated the letter. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. <coughs> what are we doing on temperature? Warm, warm and air. air. Warm. The folks by the thermostat can just turn it down a, toward, a little bit towards cooler. It'll go pretty quick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to be co-presenting or okay. tag-teaming on some of our testimonies. Okay. 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 Look at that. You came with one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Brings it wherever he goes. <laughs> okay.
<laughs> would anybody like a copy of this testimony? Yes. Everyone. And actually, yeah. for the future, everybody would like a copy of that. No, so yeah. we, I think you'll get to know our particular I overestimated hard copy. Yeah. 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 No, Brian. Yeah. I, I guess I overestimated. Yeah. Yeah. We have a few yeah. other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Starting yeah. is going to get for clinging to the forest products and it's turned out to be supporting it. Um, oh, you wanted to? Very good. Um, maybe for Mark's benefit, the folks who generally like to have paper copies, can you raise your hands? Yeah, Very good, thank you. Thank you. So I think as many of you um, are aware by now that um, administration represented by Peter Walk and um, Vermont Natural Resource Council, kind of representing the environmental community, if you will, has been hard at work all summer long on um, looking at our draft bill and trying to find some um, ways to create a bill that many of us can support. Um, they've been checking in with me along the way, and um, so I thought it would just be helpful for all of you to hear where they're at, and then we'll see where we are. Today's review is going to be a little bit more similar to what Ellen did, high level, um, and then we are expecting actual draft language on this um, Tuesday of next week, a week from today? Yes. Great. Uh, for the record, I'm Peter Walk. I'm the Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources. And Brian Shoup, uh, Executive Director of the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to come here before you today on obviously the first day of session. I'm really excited that you guys are getting back into this immediately. Um, we are talking about one of uh, the most consequential historic laws in the state of Vermont and, and necessary updates to it. And we appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk to you. Your work last session, as Ellen discussed, built on the work of the Act 47 Commission and raised critical challenges and opportunities to modernize Act 250 um, and to meet the contemporary issues that we deal with today. Over the, as, as the Chair mentioned, over the course of the summer and fall, uh, the, the administration, along with uh, Vermont Natural Resources Council, came together to see if there were opportunities to take where you guys finished off and see if we could make progress to an area where we could reach consensus on certain issues. Um, and in doing that work, we relied heavily on both where you were, where you got to and then the intent behind the work that you were doing. What were you trying to, what challenges and problems were you trying to solve? Um, and so some of the things that we will present to you today will look very similar and some of them may vary but comply with the sort of intent behind your deliberations. And so. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Brian, um, and we look forward to, to walking this through with you and then and then hearing your feedback. Just to, as, a, as a reminder, some of the issues that really prompted the legislature to establish the commission and, and um, start this work included just that the, the law is 50 years old. Um, it's dated. Uh, some of the environmental challenges that we <coughs> recognize today really weren't <laughs> widely recognized then, like wildlife habitat connectivity and forest fragmentation, climate change, whatever. Um, a, a large issue. Um, there's been changes in the law over the years that have um, resulted in it losing some of its consistency across the state. The elimination of the environmental board in 2004 or 5 um, has made the, the districts a little bit more unwieldy than they than they were. Um, projects are more complicated, and the process has gotten more complicated. Um, and a little bit, it's it's become more challenging for folks, especially folks who aren't. Um, really experienced in Act 250 or represented by attorneys to participate in, especially the appeal process. Um, and the, the changes in state permitting and local and regional planning and state designation programs have all, those, those have evolved considerably since the early 1970s when Act 250 was written. So um, this is an opportunity to align the law with kind of where we stand today with environmental regulation and land use planning. Um, as Peter said, we really relied heavily on the work that the, uh, that the committee did, although we did agree that we would um, keep an open mind and, and agree to kind of revisit some of our past positions in, in an effort to see if we could come up with new ideas that haven't been talked about, and I think we've succeeded in that, and we'll tell you about those. Um, so as, as um, Chair mentioned, we're going to be prepared to provide a more detailed 
uh, draft bill to you. Um, Matt Chapman from the Agency of Natural Resources, Donna Groveman from uh, um, former NRB chair and from VNRC, Greg Bubel, the general counsel for the Natural Resources Board, have been working with Ellen on drafting a new bill to put some of these ideas into, into draft statutory language. Um, so we're going to organize our, our presentation into five categories, similar to what Ellen did. Uh, changes in jurisdiction, uh, modernization of the Act 50 criteria, the structure and function of the NRB, um, updates to Act 250 permitting and permit conditions, and then some additional work that we feel is warranted on some of the issues that we weren't able to resolve, but we think um, with, with further time and deliberation, we can come up with some um, additional changes to complement the work that we're proposing. So the, um, probably the area that's in some ways most similar to uh, what Ellen walked through was jurisdiction. Um, we all, uh, um, from early in the process, I think the states have acknowledged that the state's land use and development goals are, are for that kind of elusive settlement pattern of compact settlements around the lay open countryside. That's been on, on the books in various forms since the 1960s. Um, the state has created some designation programs and planning processes in order to uh, try to achieve that pattern, um, that smart growth development pattern. And we feel as though, like the commission decided, the committee decided last year, there's an opportunity to align Act 250 to reflect those, those goals and those other programs that are in place. So what we were, were proposing, similar to what the committee did, was we exempt development in designated downtowns and neighborhood development areas. Um, from Act 250 review. Those are the areas that are, are uh, generally um, the most carefully thought through and the most rigorous uh, 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 designation processes from the state with some environmental protections associated with those processes. Um, and we think that it's inappropriate to send a signal that this is where we want to see our development occur in our, in our designated areas to reinforce those historic settlement patterns. Um, we also, though, there are other designated areas that don't have as rigorous a review process, but do have certain um, benefits associated with them now. Growth centers, new town centers, village centers um, are all treated different for priority housing areas or priority housing exemptions. Just for affordable housing and mixed use housing. Um, I don't want to get into the detail now, but we propose no changes to that, continuing to maintain those programs to support priority housing in those other designated areas. Um, uh, forest fragmentation and just general resource fragmentation has been a, a big challenge. This committee has recognized that as a, as a goal to deal with it. Um, Ellen mentioned bringing back the road rule. I, I would characterize it differently. I think the road rule um, wasn't particularly effective. It had some kind of, it resulted in some perverse development patterns people, as people tried to avoid it. So we looked at a more um, kind of comprehensive encroachment rule that would look at, at combination of roads and driveways uh, um, with a larger um, uh, a larger length to trigger uh, Act 250 jurisdiction. We'll get into detail about that. So it's a, a form of the prior road rule, but we don't feel as though, uh, we feel it's a, a much improved one and will we'll do a better job and not result in some of the um, adverse consequences that happened with the old road rule. Um, we uh, also agreed uh, to a, a variation of jurisdiction around interchange areas with the caveat that some regional planning commissions and municipalities do uh, planning around those areas and if they uh, <coughs> can document that they are, um, uh, they change the boundaries from the arbitrary 2,000 feet that we would suggest that there be a process in place to allow the municipalities to do that through their own local regulations. And we've outlined that in the draft statute or the draft legislation. Um, and then finally, there was uh, an issue that the administration brought before the committee last year about exempting transportation facilities from um, um, Act 250. We opposed that. The committee also didn't agree to go along with that. What we've agreed to, to do is uh, identify for jurisdictional purposes the, the acreage requirement necessary to trigger Act 250 review. Just a reminder, in some towns, that's a one, or actually with with public process, it's 10 acres of new area. Um, we agreed that uh, we would exempt um, already developed area. If, if, it's a, if it's a road 
capacity increase, you don't look at the existing road that's already built, you only look at the new area to trigger that, that review. With the understanding that um, any new accesses to controlled access highways to our interstate system would, would not be subject to that, would trigger Act 250 review because of the growth and development issues associated with that. So those are the, the jurisdictional changes we'd propose. Um, oh, I Originals. think I missed one, yeah. Uh, you also struggled with um, uh, whether to lower the 2,500 el foot elevation trigger um, for Act 250 review. Currently under Act 250, anything above 2,500 feet triggers Act 250. Uh, you, I believe in the draft bill, have lowered it to 2,000 feet. Um, after a lot of um, kind of map reading and analysis that we did with the agency and talking to a lot of other stakeholders, we thought that we should not treat everything equally, that we should look at the physical characteristics of the land in determining jurisdiction. So what we agreed to with the administration, uh, and this is supported by some of the folks who we've been sought um, advice from on this issue, is that we define ridge lines in that we uh, identify ridge lines over 1,500 feet um, as as triggering jurisdiction, but just the ridge lines, not all land over that. So a high elevation plateau. Um, I know in some towns there's a lot of development at about 15, 16, 1,700 feet because it's not a defined ridge line. It's old hill farms, so we <coughs> exempt those areas, and we're still kind of working through how that how that definition would work and how it might be mapped to provide guidance to the district commissions. So again, ridge lines over 1,500 feet, areas around interchange areas, um, and uh, a combination of road and driveway construction would all trigger Act 250 review, and it would be exempted in neighborhood development areas and downtowns, and we would continue to treat uh, growth centers and designated village centers and new town centers as priority housing areas. I'm seeing the elevation one here. It is tucked into the uh, question. What we really framed this around the issue we were trying to tackle, and the question was sort of connectivity, habitat, and and forest blocks. And so it's third in together with the the road rule section and ridge line jurisdiction. Okay. Oh, I got it. Right. And in, in some respects, the two are related because generally you have long roads and driveways to access our remote areas. Uh, just, just one quick clarifying um, question. Did you indicate that the definition for a ridgeline would include land above 1,500? Is that, it, is that, is that elevation? The intent is, in the to, is to have a ridgeline above an elevation. So if, okay. if it, it, you have to be above a certain elevation and it has to be on a ridgeline okay. to, to qualify. Thank you. Uh, so a 1,200-foot ridgeline would not trigger at 250. Yeah. I, I wrote it down, but I just still don't see it. That, that level of detail is not here. We'll walk you through in the language. I think it's going to be easier. There's going to be, this is, a, as you see, this is a big package. We want to walk through and sort of walk, be able to talk about all the concepts and, and, and discuss them with you and then go and get into more detail as we go through if that, if that works for the committee. Re Representative Odie, it's, it's the very last couple of words in the third bullet. On which page are you? On uh, page on two. Page two. Any other questions Thank for this you. section? So I'd, I'd like to talk about the sort of updates to the criteria component. Um, you'll find that many of these are similar to what you worked on already last session. Um, one of the challenges that you worked through, and there was a long section in, in Ellen's spreadsheet around climate change, we believe we found um, some ways to address those through existing criteria and updates and uh, some other updates as well. So if you'll go to page three of your packet there. First, we start with, uh, as, as you did, updating uh, Criterion 1D to incorporate river corridor and flood hazard area concepts that is uh, consistent with the way the Agency of Natural Resources uh, use those resources. Uh, the update to Criterion 5 to address walking, biking, and transit concerns. Um, the same with um, with forest blocks and connectivity, kind of connecting habitat and Criterion 8. We suggest that it would be appropriate for the board to issue rules around how to comply with that because it could be um, something that could be complicated and therefore it would make sense to have very clear and explicit instructions from the board on how to 
uh, to prove compliance with that criterion. <coughs> um, we propose to add uh, lands that are conserved uh, by the Vermont Housing Conservation Board um, to the to the definition of, of public investment in 9K. Um, and the same with the um, change that you made to only those towns that have a approved plan would receive that deference under under Criterion 10. And I have a question, and it's maybe just for the lawyers who do this in the room, but that um, the, the, the town plan, I mean, that you, you go to the town plan now under Act 50 review, is that only when the zoning is not clear? Am I remembering that right? No, I, I think it's the yeah. opposite. Yeah. Um, Other way around. The district the commissions that. currently go to the town plan, okay. and if the plan is <laughs> Uh, vague and ambiguous. They look to the zoning for clarification. To see if it's clear. And that's based on case law. And the zoning <coughs> doesn't need to be approved. I mean, this is that, that's true. And, and just for uh, for the committee's information, um, currently uh, a plan does not need to be approved to have uh, standing <coughs> under criterion 10. Right. Um, okay. That's a proposed change, both in the committee bill and what we're proposing. And presumably, though, if it's approved, it would have the clarity that, that would allow it to be useful to the review. Not, not necessarily. <laughs> Simply. No. Um, sometimes municipalities are reluctant to be too prescriptive in their plans, and that, that leads the decision makers to look elsewhere for a clarity. But they're too prescriptive. No, they're not yeah, prescriptive. Yeah, right. Enough. That's been the problem historically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And then the, the final piece uh, relates to your work around <laughs> climate change. Uh, you talked a lot about um, residential building development, commercial building development, and energy standards related to that. In it, in a, uh, <coughs> the good news is that the um, Public Service Department is working on the RBs and the CBs as the residential building energy standard and the commercial building energy standard. There will be updates to those um, by this coming fall. And so we believe it's appropriate to, uh, to, to build those into the to meeting that criterion. And um, at right now, uh, meeting the stretch code is, is sort of the only way to comply with, with that portion, but then we suggest making it explicit so it's easier for everybody to understand. Uh, and those are the, the, and I will say so that the other piece that is really important is many of the Act 250 criteria address the adaptation to climate change related to river corridors and other things, and we uh, expected we propose some uh, clear indication that we want to see, you know, that, that Act 50 would look to see site design and building design that, that made sure that the property was resilient to a changing climate, which we think is appropriate. Um, moving on to the middle of uh, page three, the permit, uh, permitting and permit conditions. Um, this is, we, um, you took significant testimony on these topics last year. These are ones we believe are, are pertinent to discuss, and there's some, there's some new concepts in here that we want to consider with you. Uh, the first one you've heard, uh, this is part of the, uh, the uh, part of this was uh, in H197, which was the administration's bill last year on proposals on changes to Act 50 relating to conditions on the activity of forest space enterprises. Uh, we built on that proposal uh, and worked to address some of the committee's concerns about the private property rights of abutting landowners, uh, while still addressing the need to create uh, a reasonable hours of operation um, for changing uh, con land conditions under the operation of these facilities, right? We have a changing climate that is, is preventing our uh, forest operating, forest processing facilities from operating at the same length of time that they did throughout the year because the ground simply isn't frozen and we can't get logs out of the woods. So, this changes that opportunity and makes some, some changes that we think that the committee will appreciate and we look forward to moving forward. Um, so this is a, the, the next one is a new one. That's the last paragraph on the bottom of page three. The Public Utilities Commission um, requires for, for certain projects a 45 day no, no, notice process. And so what essentially a notice of that you intend to file the application, what that gives those people who are involved in the review time to do is to get together and talk to the applicant about the project to understand where 
where uh, the issues may be so that we can all talk together to see if we can resolve them well in advance of them coming up for actual application. We have found that process to be significantly helpful with project applicants who have, have opportunities for change before they get to the sort of full permitting process that is really helpful and it helps make sure that we're getting the resource protections that we need in order and having the, it work on, on, on project applicants' timelines. So we propose under Act 250 for all major permits or, per, or permits that would likely be majors to have a 30-day public notice process. Um, the next piece uh, is the inclusion of the provisions to encourage industrial park master planning that was in A2097, I believe uh, every, most people felt comfortable with in this room. Um, and then one of the issues we've heard from stakeholders is the um, amount of time it can take uh, for district commissions to get feedback on Criterion 6 and Criterion 7. Um, we propose a simple change to establish a timeline for that feedback so that there is some knowledge of when that's going to occur so that, that the you know that a applicant has some clarity as to when that was is going to happen uh, finally you t talked a little bit ellen talked a little bit about the idea of uh the presumption that a and r permits are afforded under under act 50 currently uh, in H-197, the administration proposed to, to change that presumption. Um, what we've instead done here is to expand it beyond the current list of A&R permits, which is established by board rule, to all A&R permits under the same pre presumption scheme that currently exists. And you'll probably be able to give us a list of those different yeah. permits. Yes, we will. I mean, is it just because like new permits have come online and they were never added, or is it? Yes. Okay. Still, it would be interesting to see. Yep. What will get added? Um. So one of, one of the reasons that initial scoping process is important because we, we really took a new, fresh look at the administration of Act 250, and this is probably the most significant change from the bill that you considered last year. And it's, 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 it will be, a, it would, if it went into law, it would be a very significant change to Act 50. Um, it would probably be the, as significant as the elimination of the Environmental Board in 2005 when uh, appeals were sent to the court. Um, we've been concerned all along that there needs to be an accessible process, it needs to be fair, it needs to be consistent, um, you know, within reason across the state. Um, and it needs to um, to be relatively predictable in terms of at least how much time is required to get through the process. So very much like the verb, what we're proposing is an enhanced natural resources board, which would be three members with um, representing uh, different professional backgrounds, um, not only law, um, screened by a judicial nominating committee and appointed to six-year terms. However, we uh, and, and the significant thing about that Natural Resources Board is they would not be an appellate body, they would replace the district commissions in the review. Um, we were concerned, however, when we talked about this, that we need to keep some regional representation, so the review would be conducted by a professional board and two regional members um, who would participate in certain aspects of that process. Um, so there would still be a regional um, review meetings with regional representation, but you'd have a standard review by the three-member natural Re enhanced natural resources board, um, and those decisions would be appealed to the Vermont Supreme Court. So that's significant in several respects. It, it replaces the district commission process um, with a consistent statewide board representing a broader um, a range of perspectives. Um, which was a value of the environmental board when they heard appeals. This would only apply to major uh, projects. We would define what a major project is. That determination would be made by the regional coordinator, the district coordinators that exist now, um, although we are proposing some restructuring of the districts and 
how, how they're configured and the, num and the number of them. And those decisions on whether it's a major or minor would be appealable to this to this board. So there'd be oversight over the district coordinator, but they would be responsible for handling the minor, um, much like a zoning administrator handles a minor. They, they really are writing the minors now, and district commissions play a minor role in, in reviewing them, signing off on those decisions. Um, so that's, I'm going to back up again. So that's very, very uh, a significant change. Eliminating the district commissions, replacing them with a professional board, an enhanced natural resources board with district or regional representation for major reviews. And that would eliminate a step in the appeal process. Currently, if the district commission makes a decision, it's appealed to the environmental court. Their decision is appealed to the Vermont Supreme Court. So uh, original jurisdiction at the local, uh, at, at, the, at the natural resources board, and that goes, skips a step on its way to the Supreme Court. Um, we're still writing some of the, the rules around making sure that citizens who aren't represented by attorneys would be treated fairly and have access to the process, um, which is an, an important principle that we think we can achieve through through this board. So, um, can I also, I'll also add that the plan is the the way we have drafted now is all. Uh, hearings for those major permits would occur in the municipality where the project is located, right? So that it is still a local process, but the consistency is occurring by having the same uh, three individuals making those determinations around the state as the application of that law. And have you looked at volumes of major applications and whether a single board would have the capacity to fulfill the review requirements in a timely manner? Um, we, we have talked about that, and we have agreed that this needs to be adequately resourced. We feel, though, it can do it. One, one other aspect of the enhanced NRB is the ability to appoint hearing officers. So if it's a major project, but it's not especially complicated or you know, heavily contested by different parties, um, a hearing officer could review, could review and, and conduct the review, <coughs> write the decision, and then the board could could decide whether to sign off on that. This, this model is, is other than the local representation, which is a new component, and we think it's particularly important for the jurisdiction of Act 250, but the, the sort of board process and the hearing officer process models very closely the Public Utilities Commission's pro current process, and we relied heavily on the existing precedent there. And some of the feedback we've gotten about the PUC is it's not as open to citizen engagement. So how would we be addressing So this? we address that through, as, as Brian mentioned, the, the work to help it make it a more accessible process and to be having the, all the hearings in the local area where uh, community members can participate. In, in that early um, kind of dispute resolution process, or that early process is, is um, I think more meaningful than the Public Utility Commission. They often have a pre-hearing, but it's not on the record. It's not anything that really feeds into their decision making. And we view this as an opportunity to um, work out some of the disputes before they get to the board. And are you imagining that district commissions still exist? No. As, not at all. But the district coordinator positions still exist. And then so there would be district commissioners still appointed or uh, how did we label those match? Regional, commission. Regional commissioners appointed to be the representation from those. So in, in, in Middlebury, for example, there would be two Addison County, um, or what, however the district configured, if it would be multiple counties, representatives from that region who only review projects in that region in conjunction with the, um, the Natural Resources Board. Representative did you take testimony from uh, members now who serve on the district commissions? We did not take testimony. We met with um, uh, prior and existing district commissioners, prior and ex uh, district coordinators, and some of our partners out there. Um, this is not this is not a consensus piece. It was agreed among us that it would be a workable solution to some of the issues that we've been dealing with. Well, you know, it seems to me we've gone we've been at this for about eighteen months now. This is the first time I've ever heard it. We had sat in commission with a six-member commission. It never came up there. We never heard in any testimony that people appeared before us. We had uh, all last year. We had this bill in front of us. Now all of a sudden, uh, we're presented with a whole new ball game. And I, uh, 
mean, it's my feeling. It's we're, we are the legislators. We're the ones who supposedly write policy. And all of a sudden, we're now being, you know, uh, confronted with something like a fait accompli. This is what, what we're proposing. This is everyone here is saying that we, we, we get along with this fine. Mm -hmm. I, I just feel we would be uh, being left out of this process. No. Well, I, okay, if I could respond to that, I would say that's not how I'm looking at it. Okay. I'm looking at it as this, we will be reviewing this. And this is, a, I think, this most, this is the single biggest thing we haven't, it's the single biggest new thing in this proposal. And I understand, like, this may need more vetting than we are capable of doing in this session. Um, and that, that's what we're, so that's why we're doing the high level walkthrough today and kind of processing that as a proposal. The, the reason that I said, yes, let's keep keep this on the table when they came to me, is that we didn't get a lot of traction um, on the verb that was in our bill. We, we had a pretty big split on the committee, on our committee, on, on the changes that were in the draft bill. And this one, to me, um, starts to address concerns on both sides. Um, and I understand if it's sort of you know, I, I don't know where it's going to take us, but I think it's worth just hearing it out. I don't see any of these proposals as fait accompli. I, right now, we're just hearing what folks with more resources to work year-round on this issue have done to help us move forward. And if we decide it's not helping us, that's fine. But this, that's the way I see this work. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I don't think either of us wanted to create a perception that we expected the board just to accept this as a fait accompli. Um, again, our goal was to, to try to take a fresh look at how to resolve both sides of the issue. Um, and it was one that the administration could agree to in a certain you know, portion of the environmental community. I'm not even saying representing. There's other groups who may not agree that it's a good idea. Um, we thought that we could accomplish kind of our various goals through this. Representative McCullough. So I'm curious, and, and we're, my question is about this last topic. Um, did you get uh, feedback from the people you worked with about this particular change? Um, other than myself, who said it eviscerates Act 250's original intent? Um, we did get feedback from some. I'm not going to represent anyone other than VNRC. And it was a, a, as, uh, like you, it was a mixed bag among some folks. It has support and it, it doesn't. I think um, our perception is um, the appeals process, especially, is not accessible. It's time consuming and it's expensive. And this is a way to resolve that um, while still maintaining regionalism and more professionalism in the review process. Sounds like you're describing a legislative process with 180 legislators. <laughs> I'm not describing a legislative <laughs> process. I wouldn't do that in front of you. <laughs> I think it's also, to speak to Representative LaFay's earlier point, what we're presenting to you is a package of things that we could come to, to terms on. There are portions of it that individually we may not love but we come to you today to say that we are trying to do some do some work and and present it to you in a way for your consideration but to know that that, that we've agreed to present this together as a as a package um, and it certainly doesn't represent a fait accompli it just represents where we got to in our in our work so did you people speak to the local districts about this proposal to uh, basically take away their power? There, there as, as Brian mentioned, there was a number of conversations around with individual members, both past and present, but we're not going to speak to the sort of the, the full range of, of current and Well, how many boards did you talk to? I, 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 can't, I can't answer that question directly. I, we, there have been multiple conversations from, from multiple people, so I, I don't know that number. Board members and district coordinators. Speak it. Did you talk to anybody in Rutland County? Uh, yes. Who would you talk to down there? I'd, I'd rather not represent anybody else. I'd rather not. I, I, and I think there's going to be plenty of opportunity for uh, witnesses from Rutland County to come in and testify. Yeah. I bet there are, there will be, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Uh, 
the issue last year before us uh, in terms of whether or not it was uh, not in terms of district commission hearing uh, a project, it was what happened on the appeal. Would it go to this verb or would it, go to, would it stay with the environmental board? That was the issue that never got resolved. Now, all of a sudden, uh, both those issues are, are out the window. I, I think there were broader issues that you were considering as well, and I don't well, want to speak for you, but I think you were considering issues of consistency, uh, consistent application, oversight of the district commissions, and the, process, the individual processes that were going on in those commissions, and we feel that this change would address many of those concerns. Well, there are very few permits that are, are, are appealed, and this would create consistency across all of the permit reviews rather than just those that were appealed. I think some of us felt, at least I felt anyway, that the district commission level, that was where that people got a chance to voice an opinion and uh, have some status in terms of what they offered uh, as to what they thought about the project. And then the district commission would make its decision and then it was, if that was appealed, then this would go to the select board, or the, the environmental court, and it was being offered as a verb, as, an, as its alternative, and they would take a very close look at what the issues were and if the appeal should go forward. Uh, I just don't, so if this professional board now says no go, then you're looking at a Supreme Court case. So for, it, yes. Yes, sir. Representative McDonald. So, gentlemen, I don't want my pointed question, which divulged my position, <laughs> to overshadow the great work you have done. I'm very appreciative, um, and, and the process is, has been a good one, and, and I thank you both for that. Many hours, I'm sure, of, of, of sweat and angst went into what the bullet points are here, and there's more work to come as it becomes legislation proposals, and I do thank you for that. I think there's one more section. Four. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I, that's me. Um, so bottom of page four, uh, these are areas where uh, topics of conversation during the commission process, during your committee hearing last year, and some other topics that we believe are pertinent to discuss. First and foremost, uh, the discussion that you had and that Ellen mentioned around the uh, critical resource area piece, one of the critical components of that was river corridors. Um, there is an existing river corridor permitting pro and flood hazard area permitting program now within the Department of Environmental Conservation at the Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, we would propose to align uh, the permitting jurisdiction um, we, we would, we would, so one of the things you were considering, let me step back, one of the things you were considering was expanding Active 50 jurisdiction into all river corridors. As a counter proposal, we would suggest that it makes more sense to align the river corridor program, or the river program with uh, a, a direct permit to address that rather than pulling all projects into Active 50. So right now, uh, we would propose, we're able to move forward within the program to, to create a, if you, if you needed to comply with, um, with 1D uh, under current Active 50 jurisdiction, to meet that, to get that pres presumption, you would come into a &R to get a, a, a permit from the Rivers program. And we do that now? No, not for, not for all projects. You, you, the, the same level of analysis happens as the river program comments on during the Act 250 process. This would create a specific specific permit that aligned and created a presumption. And, okay, because it's part of your three steps. Okay. Yeah. The second step would be we're in the process of mapping high priority river corridors across the state. Um, we would propose when that process is done and we've had time to, to, to in to figure out how the program will work to incre increase jurisdiction to those high priority river corridors. And then we would propose a third step of sort of stepping back and evaluating to see whether uh, changes in jurisdiction from there were needed. Um, so that is the proposal we propose to make with regards to river corridors and how they interrelation with Active 50 and beyond. What makes a corridor high priority? Uh, I'm happy to provide a river scientist to provide that uh, analysis. That is not my expertise. Representative McCullough. Um, question about the mapping. Mm -hmm. um, 
<laughs> get into my disgruntlement. Um, agency mapping work, um, of course, blocks and connective um, uh, corridors, we've been told is not to be used for jurisdictional purposes. We need a specific, I believe, uh, statement that says the mapping that you're doing in this regard is to be used for jurisdictional purposes. Is that the is that is that your intent? I think we want to be clear that we use mapping across the agency in multiple forms. Understood. Some of them are jurisdictional, some of them are advisory. In this particular instance, it would be jurisdictional. Thank you. Um, then we propose two uh, planning processes to occur or stakeholder processes to evaluate a couple different components. One uh, builds on whether or not the their, the A&R permitting presumption should change. We'd also like to include in that review of A&R permits on the record. That has been um, something that was under discussion under Act 150 of 2016 and the legislature directed us to make some significant changes to the way we conduct public processes and other components. Uh, we believe it's time to, to evaluate whether on the record review is appropriate for A&R permits. The next step in really involves many of the, the plans um, that you heard about through, um, through Ellen's discussion is looking at many of those topics, how they're approved, how they're, you know, the findings associated with them, et cetera, and putting those together into a broader stakeholder process to to go through that. We think that there will be a significant period of time needed for that, but um, we, in our work together, did not feel that we were ready to come forward to the recommendations on those, and so we think that, and obviously we are only a small component of the relevant stakeholders and want more people involved in that process. Um, and I think the Vermont, have the Vermont planners been working on some of this? as well. I believe they are constantly working on <laughs> some of this, but yes. But I mean um, on, on providing us input. I think they are. Yes. Um, I also would be remiss if I didn't say very clearly that uh, what you might see is missing from this proposal is a proposal from around trails. Uh, the, we want to make clear that, that a trail component of this is a key part of the package. Um, we The stakeholders continue to work to develop that proposal and we and the administration will continue to provide technical and support and feedback to that group, and we believe that the topic can be resolved in time to be included in, in a package that moves forward. On the House side? Yes. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Never really. Believe is a relatively weak word. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so if, can you tell us what the sticking issues are? Summarize what's happening. This process has, has, has taken a lot longer I think, than any of us anticipated. Who are you asking specifically? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you, okay. but if there's someone else in the room that you think would be better able to answer, that's fine to hear from them as well. I'm, I am happy to spot. look to my, I would, I would presume to look to my colleagues or some of the stakeholders in the room who might like to speak to it. So that, that I have not been directly engaged in that discussion. Sure, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Billy Coster, Agency of Natural Resources. So you might recall that uh, at the end of last session, um, representatives from the Vermont Forest Partnership and the various trail user groups uh, asked for time to work together to see if they could negotiate um, an alternative review structure for active, or for a regulatory review of trails. Um, that work commenced through the spring and into the summer, and late summer, early fall, they provided A&R a conceptual proposal on what that might look like. Um, we spent some time in the fall trying to flesh that out to what an actual program to support that concept would entail. That process um, identified a number of, of fairly significant gaps and questions in that conceptual proposal that we brought back to the stakeholders. Um, they're concurrently working to resolve those issues and to determine whether they have agreement on how to handle them. We're also working on a slightly different approach that we think can bring conclusion to this issue um, in a more expedited way. So we hope within the next week or so to wrap that up, and that's what Peter, I think, suggested we would hope to bring, or believe we would believe. bring that. Believe. <laughs> so it's, there's yeah. two, parallel things happening if 
We've got a plan B. Unlikely event at the. I should say that. Okay. So if we make it through the next We'll get one or the other, or possibly both. Yes. Yes. Will Act 250 still have jurisdiction on transit? No, you're not. You're looking at I, I think it depends on which one of these avenues um, emerge at the end of the, the week. What we okay. Yeah, just for uh, why it may, maybe one reason it was a little time consuming, the Forest Partnership is five different organizations with different perspectives. The trail groups are, oh, there's, there's mountain biker associations, there's the big statewide trail groups, there's motorized trails, so there's, there's different perspectives that have been different issues associated with the different trail organizations that we've been talking to. So it, it, it was more complicated than just, you would think, talking about trails. And it, it took longer than I think we had hoped. And to all their credit, they, they worked extremely hard and did a remarkable amount of work kind of bridging those divides and getting to a place where they could uh, negotiate in good faith around the details. Um, but just all that with those many participants took some time. Uh, and maybe it, it just, I don't want to put you on the spot, Jamie. Jamie Fidel has been our point person on doing with that, if you have anything to add. Uh, yeah, Jamie Fidel with BNRC. I would just say that we've spent many, many hours on this, and we're taking this really seriously, and there's a lot of different organizations that have invested a lot of time. And I think even more than just that diversity of the organizations, it's just there's a lot of complex questions to ask, a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different good questions that the agency asked our groups to, to further clarify and and our goal is to try and speak with one voice and offer the agency and you as the legislature the most comprehensive well thought out package possible and so i know that from the forest partnerships perspective groups that that i've been working with we have answered all the questions and shared them with the trail groups and right now we're hoping that we're going to be able to come to consensus and quickly get that feedback back to the agency and then in a best case scenario allow for there to be a legislative proposal that could be part of this package that would allow the program to be built which would ultimately create an alternative program. Are you aware of what's going on now in Eastwood? In the trail of the mountain bike trails up there? Yes. You know I mean that's created a like a fissure or a crack in that whole kind of sport that everybody thought was going to uh, be very have a very benign impact on the environment, and uh, was a very much a big money maker. Those towns up there have no industry whatsoever, and all of a sudden now it's, it appears to be in jeopardy. Uh, if there's a, if someone else besides the town of Victory objects to the, uh, these trails going forward without an Act 50, then what's going to happen to the existing trails? Uh, you know, I don't know. I guess those are legal questions, but I know it's created a lot of unease, mm -hmm. uh, and it's added to. Uh, I might add, I might. Uh, Point to talk to it. It's add, added to a, a lot of people's uh, uh, dissatisfaction with uh, 250. So I, I'm hoping you take those into consideration and the impact it's having on, on that area, especially. I appreciate that. And I would just speak from our perspective. Sure. We're aware of that, and we have discussed that scenario and how it could be addressed through the, the work that we're doing. Any questions? Other questions? Thoughts? Ideas? Concerns? <coughs> the only thing I, I, I may ask is, is I again appreciate you all working together to, to help us move forward with a more thoughtful, more collaborative bill. I mean, this is a very complex bill, um, and to have the coming together you all over the course of the last few months really help us address some of these big important issues that are having an impact across the state is really um, commendable. So I thank you for that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so committee, let's take a break and then just come back uh, in, at 2.30. Yeah, no, I think about it. Yeah, 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 I think about
This was the overview introduction, and then we will we will get the um, specific language. But are there things that are on your mind right now? Uh, thanks. As I was listening to the conversation, uh, I think it's important to go back and, and, and think about what the Act of Seven Commission was set out, what it set out to do which is to look at uh, the fact that the status quo back to 50 in many cases doesn't work. It doesn't work anymore. And that we set out a attractive bill to modernize uh, back to 50. We certainly, 50 years later, have a better understanding of the environment, natural communities, and the corridors, forest transportation. Uh, we, we, I think, came to the understanding that uh, through testimony that the district commission process in many cases is inconsistent. That doesn't really work that well, particularly for majors. Uh, and we've listened to a lot of testimony from a lot of different stakeholders, and we heard more testimony today from uh, the administration and uh, environmental groups, other stakeholders. And I think it's important to listen to what they have to say. Uh, what they're saying to us is not necessarily what we're going to do. Uh, we as a committee decide what's going to come out of this committee, not the stakeholders. Uh, they have expertise, they provide that expertise, and then it's our job to, uh, to reach some consensus of what we want to move forward with this process. Those are my two cents worth. Yeah, good. Thank you. Others? Carol? Well, I'm just glad to know where the administration is and where the, uh, the NRC is. And you know, then we'll, we'll make our decisions, but at least we've gotten that far. It feels like progress. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding mm -hmm. my my um, observation about evisceration. Um, I think that the summer's work, which I, so this is a duplication of what I said afterwards. I think um, the NRC and others along with the administration have done the Omen's work. Um, it, it is up to us to, to take all the input we get and come up with the best product we can. And um, I think it's important um, that Trevor's two cents be recognized that for at least a dollar ninety-eight. <laughs> it was good, good advice for all of us, and, and for myself included um, in that. All of us. So I look forward to to a, a, a renewed focus this January. Um, no, um, starting immediately um, two and a half hours ago of getting this bill um, as good as we can get it and pass it with a good, um, good voice out of this committee and get it on its way to the Senate with a good voice on the floor. Um, they, they will have their work cut out for them no matter what we send them. And, and guaranteed what we send them cannot be perfect. And what, what, <laughs> any more than it'll be perfect when it gets out of their, their end. But we gotta, we gotta, we, we really need this focus. And um, I'm looking forward to all of us working together for that. Great. Um, other thoughts? Yeah, I'm just move on. I, I guess I would just say the process right now 
that I've outlined is with this orientation today, put Act 250 on a pause till next week when we get specific language. Um, I'm open to hearing if there's something that you all um, feel like you need to hear that's not in this or that you have questions or concerns that our council could be working on. If you can bring them up, if you know them now, that would be great. Um, or if that makes sense to you, that, that's sort of what, that's what I'm thinking, <coughs> that we would be revisiting 250 again in a week, um, unless you're ready to hear from others. As, as pointed out in the break, um, this does not represent all of the stakeholders or the, on, on either or any of the sides of the issue. Um, I thought it would be most productive to have specific language presented um, before we started to hear from others on this, but if you have other ideas, I'm open to how you want to go forward on this. Um, I don't know that I, that, that, that this comment is exactly to that task. Um, any, anything about the Slaters is still glaringly absent. Right. And, and, and I understand a letter did get written, and the sooner we see that and can start thinking about the impact of that letter, the better. Well, that letter did not result in the administration um, pulling together the process that we requested. Mm -hmm. That was sent in June, yeah. and they didn't do it, and Diane just left. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was thinking of having Diane in to tell us the current status, mm -hmm. but it could be also that... Um, is Billy here still? Greg is here. Greg is here. Greg. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's really not a lot to report from the board's perspective. Um, there is no report, there is no stakeholder process. I think the chair is really interested in completing um, the mapping of all the slate quarries that currently exist pursuant to the exemption in um, Act 250. About 90%, and th this may not be news to you, but about 90% of the quarries have been mapped. Um, at one point, about a year and a half, two years ago, ANRIT took it on. They had a an intern who was studying GIS at UVM who was able to do the vast majority of the work. And um, as I understand it, there's about 10% left to map, but that requires some resources that either the, <coughs> neither the board nor the agency has right now. Well, I would suggest that, that we need that kind of testimony. And what does mapping mean? Because they bought, they were all mapped a long time ago on a on a on a dinner napkin. Uh, right. So we, right. we need a better understanding of what that means, and um, and then we. But I, I would also say we don't need any more testimony from either side in Slate Valley. I think we've heard it all a lot, and uh, from the administration, yes. Mm -hmm. Test. You want to hear testimony from the administration? Yes. Yeah. On the slate issue, I am wondering if we could have a map of the uh, affected homeowners and other owners' properties to see how many people are we talking about, how many homes are we talking about where there is uh, an issue with noise or trucks going by and so forth. Is this 15 houses? Is this 28 <coughs> houses? like to know that. Okay. Anything else? Have you given any thought to whether or not we should try and get another deadline on the trails? <laughs> uh, I guess the hope is that they'll be, they'll be ready have something when this bill Act 50 vote passes out, and I'm just wondering if that's really feasible. I guess um, the trails has been in motion for quite some time, and if um, we don't get something back, it stays the way it is, and I think then it's a bigger issue. We could. Um, 
we could set the wheels in motion in our bill for a requirement for planning for trails or whatever we identified as the blockades. Mm -hmm. We could put that in our bill, but if we don't do that, I would say it stays the way it is and we move the rest through and then it's something we can take up later, next year. So just cut it out. I mean, I, I'm not really, a, I have a very sure uh, understanding of what the issues are, but are the major issues that are resulting in causing such a long delay or such a long process. Uh, I don't know if they've come forward and well, define them, of course, a little better. Maybe we'd have something to report to our constituents to keep on asking. Can some of the folks involved in that conversation speak to that? request I mean we did ask for we, we got a, we got a, a, a nice answer earlier but it wasn't very specific like what are the issues that are hanging us up if we're not ready to talk about them now would you be able to talk about them next week if you haven't actually been able to address them yes okay so one way or the other we're going to hear something back on trails um, Yes. That is specific. It's either specific ideas for solution <laughs> or a specific it's outline of the challenges. Okay. That's a promise. It's on the record. That's good news. Schedule that in. Um, okay. Great. So, as um, as Harvey pointed out, <laughs> we're all getting in legislative shape again, which requires a certain different set of muscles. Um, we will um, adjourn probably now for today. I would like us to come back together tomorrow morning for more of a committee planning session to talk about um, other items. You have maybe, I hope, noticed that on our agenda is Thursday an overview of S54, which is the Marijuana Tax and Regulate. The reason that's on our agenda is that um, last year when we thought it was in a hurry, I worked to get some environmental provisions included into the bill with the folks in government ops working on the bill. And I would very much appreciate um, a more in-depth review from our legislative council on the bill and the process that's been set up. And then to have you all review what we put in there and ask questions and see if we want to um, be more specific in what we recommend that goes into that bill. The growing of cannabis in other states has created unforeseen environmental impacts <coughs> and we can learn from what the other states have done and not go down the same rabbit holes if we can help it that's my hope is that you know if we're going to do this let's try and do it right and um, having our brains in the conversation now I think can help make it more specific what's in the bill in terms of environmental protection so we're going to do that on Thursday tomorrow um, I'd like to start off the day with a review of the reports that we get every year and then ideas for how you want to follow up. How many of those reports do we want an in actual testimony taken on and a presentation on? Obviously last year we worked on a lot of stuff that could, will come back to us. So um, the, the plastics working group report will be on for the next week when we have time. The, uh, an update on PFAS, we are, are going to ask I think that will be you, Peter, probably, or two of us combined. Yes. Great. So we'll get an update from um, the Agency of Natural Resources on the, the PFAS um, water to quality testing that we started, um, the report we passed last session. And I'm out of that legislative shape, so my brain is tired already from <laughs> the day. Stuff like that. So that's what we'll do tomorrow morning. And then I expect tomorrow morning before lunch you will have free time to take care of stuff if you're like me. I have a new phone, I need password on it. We're all supposed to be transitioning to new iPads. It's time to do homework that you need to do to get yourself back in the game here. Nine. Yeah. So generally same schedule as last year, like nine to twelve on the morning session when we have committee time and um, one to four thirty on Tuesdays we all have off um, other meetings on Tuesday evening and then Thursdays we may 4:30 or 5 have a count on, and Friday generally three might expand for adjournment or three. That all makes sense. All right. Thank you all. <laughs>